Well, my mother, we had lost my father when I was four months old, and she was a school teacher. And she kept working because the war came and the women teachers had to do double duty for the men who were fighting at the front. She noticed, though, from the very beginning, when I was very young, that I had an unusual, strong response to music. Music was like sending me in a state of euphoria and uh, agitation, even, literally, and, and desire to express. And, but th she also realized that eventually I was moving to it, and I, I began to, I wouldn't say dance, but something between moving and dancing. And she said, I wonder what we should do. And the doctor said, you're right, we have to tie her out harmoniously. Those were his words. So my mother said, dance, maybe? He said, why not? And he can play front and fifth. Yeah. If I say front, let's do an écarté back. Let's do an effacé back. No, I know what it should be, yes. And the same leg as the écarté. So she took me to Paris. As I was dancing then in Roland Petit's company, I finally discovered Victor Gzowski, who was the ballet master. He had then moved to Paris from Berlin, where he had opened the first important ballet school with his wife, Tatiana Gzowski. We had a little money finally, and I was able to pay for my classes at Madame Rosanne, who gave me free classes all the time. She asked Victor Gzowski if he would consider teaching me all the classics, one after the other, all by myself, in a studio with a pianist. Okay. And Victor said, why not? I'll do that. I will invest all that in her. He taught me Swan Lake, Giselle, the whole of Giselle, and Sleeping Beauty. And I was captivated because in a way, when you have to dance those ballets, you should become captivated. You should be inspired before you tackle even the technique. It's not about technique. It's about what you want to realize with the technique, further than the technique. And we're gonna go point, turn, point, turn. And it's nothing, you'll see when you do it, it's really nothing. That's right. But what you want to do is an elegant reaching out from the second and open the leg that is going to go under you a little bit. That's right. One repeats a lot of the same things, but depending who you're speaking to, you deliver it in a different way. If you get somebody a little bit like this, you might make more like a remark. If you get somebody who's hungry, you jump right in and feed them. If you have somebody else who's a little bit distracted, you try to make it funny, maybe you are humorous. I mean, you do whatever you need to do to get across and to get through. You know what I mean. You do what you do, except roll on the floor and bark, or oh, I've done that too. Actually, I've done everything. <laughs> oh, teaching is an endless subject. Just like being a dancer is, is endless also. You want so much the students to take, and you have to learn, sometimes with a little pain attached to it and a little regret, that they will only take what they can take, or what they're ready to take. The difference with the students of today is maybe they have less time. They have less time, the teachers have less time. We do not have because for survival reasons, money raises its ugly head again, we don't have always the time to give them the time they might need. Right there. So there's still time needed for maturation of all kinds. That's it. To make a, a dancer who is also an artist, the artist dancer, not just the dancing artist, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> And Balanchine always says, said, said that. And he told me one time, with a little sadness actually, he said, the taking is much harder than the giving. He says, I have so much I would like to give, but people don't want to take. They are not ready, they don't realize what I could give them, 
they're not ready for it, so I'll leave them alone and hope that some days they will be wanting it. And sometimes they, there's a wonderful surprise of getting something we didn't expect or might not have suspected so clearly. And sometimes, just like we have regret of, about people that decide to give up because it's too much work and too hard, and that they realize they're never going to be on top of it, and they won't be loved as much as they need to be loved, because they will not become big enough or important enough. But for the people who have certain difficulties, and you don't always expect them to come through, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden because of those difficulties, like you were mentioning a dancer that you saw recently, who went on stage and was like a miracle. Whenever in class, you might never have suspected all the content of spirit, expression, and love, and you know that was to express there. So, people with a certain amount of difficulty who love it go very far. And there's a point where the coaching and the teaching it becomes really one thing, because sometimes, like with your wonderful dancers in class here at the Rock. I don't just teach, I find myself coaching also because they're already so advanced technically and so far gone that I can afford to go in the details of coaching, which I couldn't do with people that are not so secure. It would be putting the cart before the horse in a way, you know? But with them, you can. So that's delicious because coaching is always the cherry on the cake. When you've done all the hard work, the reward is the coaching because then it's so much more personal and so much more private and intimate with a person to do the coaching. In so far as the wonderful students, the talented ones, who also make the decision eventually that this is going to be it. This is going to be their way to get happy, to express themselves, to be noticed to be recognized, to be loved, to be celebrated, to be rewarded, admired, respected, the whole thing. For those people, there's a moment where you can see the transformation. Dancing, learning, becoming a good student, going further, lighting the fire, going on stage, dancing, becomes a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Dancing is entering in the world of philosophy without any question. We think we have an ego. Of course, it's a false supposition. We don't have an ego. We can afford it if we know that we don't have one. <laughs> we don't have an ego. But for people that think they have an ego, sometimes it stands in the way between the taught and the teaching, the teaching and the taught. But when the taught wants to go beyond and wants to get to where he needs to get, ego surrenders completely and disappears. And ego is always a false hypothesis anyway. So the ego disappears. And then everything starts happening because there's no more fence between who teaches and who is taught and the purpose is single. It's a single purpose. It's not one person teaching and one person listening. It's one thing getting done. My teacher, Madame Rosanne, had a great expression. We would be looking at two dancers on a stage and she would say, yes, the one on the left is very good dancer, good technician. I don't see the sacred fire. The one on the right, the legs are not so beautiful, but she has sacred fire. She will go all the way. She called it the sacred fire. Isn't that wonderful? And you know, when you think of the Olymp Olympics and carrying the torch, you know, it's like the torch gets lit and then the magic begins. Because then nothing is too much or nothing stands in the way anymore. You're going to do what you have to do to be what you should be. One, two.